I think we can just start, huh? Okay. So, first of all, I, I would like to ask you something. Try to imagine the world in which everything that you do, everywhere that you move, every email that you send, every search that you make on, on Google, for example, if you are watching some kind of movies that are maybe not uh, so, uh, you know, like uh, that you should not share with other people, or that someone knows every time when you send SMS to who you send SMS and basically everything that you search, everything that you do. We are like, you know, like uh, technology in our life became like something that is like completely part of our everyday life. You know, it's extension of our body in some way. And most of the social relation, most of the communication, most of things that we do, it's some somehow mediated through technology. How many of you have a uh, smart mobile phone? Please raise a hand. Who is using the internet? Okay. In there is one law that's going to be introduced in like uh, I think really soon that will e enable the secret service, government, police to know everything more or less everything what you do through technology. And we are going to speak now uh, about that law. We are going to try to understand the implications of that law. And we are trying to somehow see what we are going to do with that. So we have a few people, friends, who join us to, to speak on that topic. Maybe, OK, let's introduce one by one. Hi, I'm Stefan. Um, I am with Telecomics, and we had this situation Vladan described uh, earlier in Syria, and I was in the group who revealed what the Syrian government was doing, at least with uh, data from the internet. And um, yeah, so um, I can talk about this, and maybe I have some other ideas on this law, but pass on. Um, I'm Ariane Dobroshi. I'm, uh, I work with Flask normally. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, an activist against this uh, draft law. Hello, uh, I'm Kitura Kusori. I work for Balkan Investigative Reporting Network as a legal advisor. I have monitored this law from the moment they started to draft it, and I have advocated against it. You know me, right? Okay. I would just like to say, in this context, I am an activist against surveillance. Uh, and also somebody who's trying to say it's not just about the surveillance. Okay, let's try first to understand what this law is about. Yeah, so, so if I may just go through the steps that, uh, that uh, the draft law took until, until today and what the situation is today, and then we're going to go back to uh, what it means and wha what are the concepts about. So there were three efforts to send these this type of law to the parliament. Actually, uh, we are a unique country in Europe in not having this kind of law. So we are kind of in a, in a good position. It's very unique in the world uh, not to have mass surveillance, uh, especially in the, you know, including the Western society. So, so um, there were three efforts. The latest one uh, started in March of this year. And that's when the, um, the draft law that was being um, uh, discussed with the European Union, with the European Commission, um, came back to Kosovo with the seal of approval from the European Commission. And the um, Ministry of European Integration, which had uh, drafted the law, kind of, uh, came back to the civil society, certain people in the so civil society, they were not really public about it. And they said, okay, this is, our, this is what we are going to send to the parliament. Uh, what do you think? Uh, so in the first draft, uh, I'm going just to go over the main things that, that were part of it. Uh, 
or yeah, the first uh, first draft or the first time the law came, draft law, it said um, uh, it had one interface and it was going to be done by the intelligence agencies. So they were kind of the gatekeepers of who had the chance to access this uh, uh, data and metadata that was going to be uh, retained and access to, to the law. And it also had so blanket met metadata retention for 12 months. That means that uh, for 12 months, everything that you do on the internet and on your phone, uh, the metadata was going to be stored. And another problem was the author author uh, authorized institutions. So it basically said the intelligence agency has the right to access it, and the um, the the uh, security agencies, the other agencies, the police, and uh, some other agencies had uh, like the customs and other agencies had rights to access. But also, it left the door open for any other agency in the future that you know, that could be based, based on some uh, future law. So there was a lot of pushback, and then on the um, 8th of April, just a day before the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, came with a very important uh, uh, verdict on metadata uh, uh, retention, uh, the ministry sent out a new uh, draft, and then again, it this this also maintains the, the a separate uh, interface from the, from the intelligence agency. The uniqueness here now is that there is, a, there is a separate process. So the intelligence agency gets their own interface, but uh, the, um, uh, so for their own use, but also the police and other agencies uh, go through the uh, you know, through their own. Uh, I, I will just stop you for a yeah. second, just, just to make clear uh, what is metadata okay just okay you have a mobile phone okay who is like working and uh, every time when you send someone a message or speak with someone in order to for this communication to happen okay between two human beings two two people some data need to be produced okay and this data it's like a it's like on the when you are sending a I don't know a letter with on envelope. It's written to who, who written the the the, the mail to who it's going on on what time it's made, and on which location, okay, and also it's it's written in this metadata. For example, for the mobile phones, it's written the type of the mobile phone that you use. So now we are speaking, basically, who have a right, and how to access all of these data that are all the time produced. So they are produced, maybe because technology is made like that, we are not so able to, to you know, to, to live without the data. But it's a question who on which way have a right to access this information about you. Uh, so metadata, data about the data. When did you com communicate to whom and how long the co conversation took? But it doesn't actually say um, what did you say to that person? So that's that's metadata. We'll, we'll talk uh, later what this means. So um, still a blanket metadata. This is seventh of uh, um, April. The metadata surveillance is is re uh, maintained and uh, you know in, in full scale according to actually the European directive. There was a European directive in force in the EU. It was not being implemented in all of the EU countries, but. Nevertheless, this was, uh, you know, a European uh, legislation. On the 8th of April, the Court of Justice basically throws out the European directive, and now for Kosovo, there is no more, um, there is no more rationale. Um, so, and then we get a final, a final version on the. Um, on the 27th of April, I believe, we get a, a, a final draft and uh, the uh, message from the ministry that this is what they are going to send to the parliament. Lucky for us, um, soon after the parliament disbands, and uh, so they cannot consider the draft, although they did intend to send this draft to the parliament. And what this uh, third draft says, so what is going to come back again, I think, um, 
once you uh, uh, once the parliament convenes again, I think it's going to be priority legislation. AKI maintains the, the intelligence agency maintains its own interface. Um, the warrant is mandatory, but with AKI having their own kind of listening device on the on the on the wires, you cannot really say whether you know how much they are recording and what are they doing with it. So it really doesn't matter for the intelligence agency; they get a, a blanket access, I think. And uh, you we also get metadata surveillance again. Ironically, the the uh, metadata retention, I should say, is maintained, but in a in a kind of lighter version. So um, my guess is that this version is going to come back and. Uh, Stefan Kule, which is the commissioner in charge for, uh, uh, has said so that they intend to push again this, this draft law in Kosovo. So with that, I will uh, give the word to my colleague here to continue. Thank you. It's always difficult to. It's always difficult to make a presentation which uh, involves legal issues. For most of people, especially those who are not lawyer, lawyers, law is boring. Now, I'll try, I'll try to, to share my experience uh, I've had in Bern with this law and also data protection a agency uh, in a more interesting way. Um, now, technology has become part of our life. Sometimes I have the feeling that everybody thinks we're becoming expert we're becoming experts in using equipment laptops smartphones tablets we all have it and we use it but i believe most of people especially those uh, who are not lawyers or who are not very interested in in uh, uh, legal issues don't read terms and conditions those conditions that they agree just by clicking most of us we just uh, we just uh, agree to, to, to uh, terms and conditions that you, uh, different social platforms put there just because we, on, we want to have access and we want to use that platform, platform. As a result, we decide, even though we are not aware very well what we are deciding, to publish all information, all data, all, protect, all uh, information that is related to us, personal information. When joining a social network, we're likely to spend more time choosing profile picture rather than reading those lengthy documents uh, that they, they have uh, written in order for us to, to understand what we are agreeing to. While we face a lot of discoveries and inventions related to uh, technology, uh, what we are missing, I believe, is lack of awareness. Lack of awareness how this technology is impacting our life. I'm not going to speak here about NSA, WikiLeaks, or other world events that we all know about, but I will stick to what's happening in Kosovo. Ariane started, to, uh, Ariane started to, to talk about this draft law that we're having. Uh, it's a battle we're going on for three years now, and it's not finishing. Microphone, okay. Um, now, Currently, interception is regulated partially with criminal procedural code, which means oh, when, uh, when prosecution or police decide to, to intercept somebody, they have kind of legal base. How long they can intercept us, the reason, how, etc. But we're lacking a, a law, a specific law uh, regarding interception. Now, the European Commission, which basically rules here, they suggested us that we need to have a specific law because this is a practice in Europe. We started to draft a law three years ago. Uh, it was a very bad, uh, badly written law, and it stopped for some reason. And then it went back again three years after. And the, the reason actually why that law uh, was not approved in the, that draft law was not approved in the parliament, it was because it didn't make a distinction between interception that are are done for court reasons and for judicial reasons and interception that are done for for intelligence purposes. Um, now we have another draft law, 
and the, 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 the job law that we're having is still problematic. And there are three reasons why this, this uh, law is uh, problematic. Arya Nit mentioned the first one is because it authorizes unlimited institutions to have access in interceptions. Access to such sensitive data should be granted only to specialized institutions. Uh, while I was doing research about this draft law, uh, I based my research on a, on, on, on a law that is in, in uh, UK, and that is Regulation on, on Investigative Powers Act, and I believe we should follow that example, which lists all the institutions that enjoy access to interception and does not leave any option for the number of such institutions to increase. Here it's open, it's unlimited, and it gives you the possibility that the list of institutions that might have access in the future can change any time the parliament decides to. Secondly, the, the, the second problem with the law is the law foresees for the national security purposes that Kosovo intelligence agencies shall have an interception interface placed within their premises. Basically, the, co the equipment that enables them to, um, to have access to our data, they want to have one in their premises. We asked them why they didn't give, give an, any answer. We asked uh, Ministry of, Inter uh, of European Integration, and they said it's for security reason without explaining in great detail why would they do that. The third problem with this law is if we suspect we're being intercepted illegally, to whom should we address? Where do we complain? There isn't any mechanism offering us the possibility to complain. In the United Kingdom, there is a, a specialized body which deals with, with that. Um, another issue related to the procedure for this draft law is that the Ministry of uh, European Integration knew that there were some people interested in this law and they were working in a very sneaky way, away from the eyes of operators, those telecommunication operators, those who are actually going to implement this law, and of course, away from the eyes of civil society because they knew that, that might be, they might be criticized. What we do in cases when we advocate and it, it, turns, to be, it turns to be a failure because me, very often we go to parliament, we go to government, we complain, we send letters, and they do nothing. Then what we do is we go to European Commission. And this is what we did with this law. We went there, we complained, and after many, many weeks, they said, it fulfills minimum criteria. And they said it should, it's okay, it should go to the parliament. We raised this issue in every single conference with every single stakeholders. And we, w we had one question for all institutions. Tell us one, one country, a democratic country, which have this kind of law where the, uh, this interface is placed within the secret uh, uh, intelligence and they didn't have any. They said, we are sui generis and we will have a law sui generis. Uh, and this is why we objected, we, we objected the law. Currently, as uh, uh, Adyanit said, uh, the law has been stopped. It's within the prime minister office and they're waiting for the parliament to, uh, be, uh, to, to, to start its work. But at the same time, the European Commission changed its mind and they said that it's wrong and we have to review this law. Um, we, uh, the, the, second, the second thing, but very shortly, we're, I just want to, to mention how important for us is this data protection agency, which has been established four years ago. And we've tested it, and maybe during the, our, our uh, discussion, we'll, I'll have a chance to speak more about them. Uh, we have a data protection agency which is protecting the interest of a ruling party, PDK, because they have been elected by them but it's not uh, protecting our data. Uh, we need to, to, to raise awareness of people about the importance of our data, and we need also to be uh, more, uh, to advocate more how to protect our data. Otherwise, uh, we, will ha we will end up having bad reg uh, laws, bad regulation, which will endanger our personal data. Whew, great. <laughs> okay, uh, so, Surveillance is basically there, okay, and uh, and okay. On one side, there is like a argument 
like, okay, we need to collect some data in order to protect our citizens from the terrorists, from, I don't know, a lot of different things, from, <laughs> from the Germans, <laughs> okay? And, okay, on the other side, that's one side. The other side, it's our, it's our privacy, you know, like, and basically what, what some of the, the, the world influential, like, uh, uh, civil rights organizations are trying to propose is that there should be a balance, okay? So in, if you really need to hunt for someone, okay, then it should be some kind of uh, uh, legal way how to proceed with that. This should be a court order, and okay. But what, sh what you should not do, it's to do like uh, mass surveillance. And from my point of view, uh, uh, data retention is basically a, a, a form of mass surveillance because you are retaining the data of all citizens. So there is like, I don't know how many millions of people living in Kosovo. Instead of like chasing five of them that are wrong, you will for any case like keep all the data, you know, you never know. But from w what do you think like uh, Dan or, or, or Stefan, like is there a, like a balance or should we like, uh, try to 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 go in that direction or 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 something else um yeah well what what i heard it is mass surveillance yes um it's not about privacy i don't believe in privacy it's a bourgeois concept but uh, the thing is that a state should not surveil the people living in the state it's just basic thing of democracy um so the the whole um law we, we had this fight against such laws in europe uh, in several countries we had it in in austria and um, there the federal court said no it's not legal for example and um, we still have uh, we had this in germany where the federal court said okay you can do this but not like you do it now and um, we have this fight in many countries in europe um, on the other hand, it's, uh, we have to ask the question, why does the state want to surveil? And normally it's about security of the people and uh, counter-terrorism and everything, which is utterly wrong. It's not about counter-terrorism, it's about power. It's about keeping and remaining power over the people. The people who elected the government shall be reigned. <laughs> and you can do this by collecting data. And yes, it's even easier with the metadata than reading each email, but I know that you've been at this point calling this person, and yeah, you are just guilty. Uh, I think like Edward Snowden said in like some of the latest talk that for him, as a, when he was like working in NSA, uh, for him, metadata was more uh, uh, valuable than the content because metadata cannot lie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, metadata cannot lie, and if you analyze metadata, you can see not only that we were having a phone call, but with whom you called, with whom me I called, and you can rebuild social networks of people, and yeah, it's much more easy to get inside those networks if you know how they are existing. So, yes, uh, metadata is way more um, ah, I'm missing the words, great. <laughs> yeah, ma it's intrusive. Ma intrusive. Yeah, to collect it, it's much more intrusive than reading one letter or one email or listening to one phone call. Um, it's basically our, our, la our whole life is metadata. If I walk around here, even if I'm not doing phone calls, uh, the, the mobile provider will know where I am, and this is metadata as well. Even if I'm in the woods, where there's no connection, then they know where they lost my signal and where it got back into the network. So they could make a trace of my way, for example. Um, so, but, okay, the, I don't, this is probably the hardest question, but, okay, how we can deal, the, because the most of the time when you start to, like you're speaking in cafe with someone, you're drinking and like speaking about this surveillance, and then most of the time people are saying, yeah, but I don't have anything to hide. Okay, this is like the argument most of the time. So, if some of you have a like a wish to answer to I don't have anything to hide argument. 
I'd just like to point out that I don't have anything to hide. <coughs> Not really. Um, okay, I'd just like to, to add a point about the previous discussion as well. I think we, we I absolutely support the campaign of Arianet and Flutera to, to contest this stuff in law, because it's one of the ways we have to try and grasp back something from this power situation that I think Stefan totally correctly analyzed. But let's be clear, right? Their pants are completely showing, right? This is completely obvious bullshit now. What they say they use this data for, we know, as Stefan was saying, what they use this data for, right? Commercial competition, spying on people whose politics they don't like. We know why this stuff is used, okay? So we don't need to take any notice of what they say it's for and worry about this uh, abstract concept of balance. We know there's no such thing. They don't give up whatever, about balance, okay? But we should still fight it on that basis. But the other thing I want to say, which speaks to the idea of do you have anything to worry about, is something that I, I know a bit more about, maybe, than the surveillance technology as such, is the metadata and what it's used for, because it's used by all those other people, the Facebooks and the everything else's. All the metadata is now big data. All the big data has patterns in, which you can find, right? Through machine learning, you find correlations, and then you make decisions. Are you gonna get a loan? Right, you've got all these companies in the UK, you phone them, 10 minutes later they tell you, have you got a loan? You need some money, have you got a loan? Right? That decision isn't based on what you did, you've got nothing to hide, it's based on whether your friends pay back their loans. Okay? That's because this stuff can be connected in larger patterns. So it doesn't matter whether you think you personally have got anything to hide or not, it's the uses to which this larger data is gonna be put. And a lot of the time, forget transparency, the people running these algorithms, they don't even know why the answers come. The algorithms themselves don't come with explanations. It just says, hey, there's a pattern here. This guy clearly can't be trusted. Why can't he be trusted? I don't know, but don't let him fly on a plane. I'm not shitting you. That happens in the States. People are on no-fly lists for reasons that they don't know, and for reasons that I believe, the people who put them on no-fly lists don't even know, but they're on the list. Yeah, that's this kind of pre-cog situation when they are able to like analyze something and then make decisions, yeah, pre-crime. Like make the like some kind of uh, projection what will happen. Yes. Please. Yeah. So that means is that uh, in the future it could be used, and they tell us that oh, if you don't do anything wrong, if we have nothing to suspect you for, uh, we are not going to access that data. So okay, I'll suggest an alternative. Let's uh, something similar. Let's put a camera on your bedroom. It's going to be stored, encrypted into my server. And I, I um, trust me, I'm not going to be use, uh, use that against you because it's going to be encrypted and everything. And of course, I'm a nice guy. So would you do that? Of course not, uh, it, because you know that I'm going to use that. And th that's, what, uh, that's what happens. And the other thing is, um, so um, um, if you don't believe that metadata is really dangerous, hand me all your uh, phone records for, for the last 30 days. I want to see who you are talking to. And I want to see all the IP addresses and times you, you have visited those IP addresses from your computer. If you don't have nothing to hide, okay, don't hide it even from me. Why would you trust a government official and not trust me, uh, your friend? I've had this argument with, with friends. So. Um. I like the idea of a government not harming people. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's always us. If you don't have if you don't have anything to hide, so why hide it? Um, the point is, as I said earlier, it's about the power, because uh, yeah, if you if you if you uh, behave lawful and don't make anything bad, then and everything is fine for you. Yeah, but this is control. It's it's about power and control. So um, if, if in Germany we had the state of retention, um, I'm sure that many people would not act in political ways like they do today. And it's, that's, yeah, data retention is, is pest for democracy. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's really killing democracy if you, if you, if you save this data. And um, the worst thing after all is that in most cases, it's all about intelligence services and, and not about police. So uh, even in this proposal you, you read, uh, you, you talked about, it's that uh, the intelligence service of the Kosovo gets this um, uh, this API and not the police. And intelligence services are always 
working in a military way, not in a civil way, which makes, makes it even more dangerous. Yeah, but okay. The, the 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 problem of the technology. If you're speaking about mobile phones for the moment, this data need to exist, okay? And then the option, because there is, I'm not so sure that there is like something like a, a embedded in design that probably it can be made to be deleted immediately. But basically, then you are putting trust on telecom companies, and I'm, it's pity that we don't have someone from uh, a, a telecom company in this discussion but the question is okay then you need to trust the telecom company to delete data and this is when you really need to have like uh, someone you know someone also doing monitoring on on telecom companies no it's not just pushing the government but it starts with the government yep. so the government should not save my data and they should enforce law that, for example, telecom companies need to delete data. When we were advocating for this law, one of the arguments that uh, Kosovo Intelligence Agency and Ministry were, was using is that why would you trust more to a telecommunication company rather than to your own institutions? Well, my argument is that it's better to have our data in one place rather than in several places. You know, If you have it there and then you have a data protection agency which they're supposed to pro protect our data, but still they don't do it. Still, you have le less uh, chances for those data to become more public. And then again, if you have it in one place, then you would know to whom you should address, for whom to complain. But if you have it in the in police station, if you have it in, in intelligence service, if you have it in telecommunication compa company, then there is no way you can find out who, uh, who would uh, disclose those data. And okay. Can we just try to, to, to look like a bit more into the future? N now, un until I, I don't know, now we are starting to be aware that we are like under total surveillance related to like digital uh, environment, no? Starting to be, you know, it's starting on like events like this and like Snowden things, okay? But if we, if we start, if we accept this as a, as a, as a reality, what is going to, to be, from your, your point of view, like potential chilling effect of life under s total surveillance? You know, so. Um, in history, we had this total surveillance state already. Uh, Eastern Germany, about uh, 4.5 million people were spying on each other. And people just did not went to events. They were not talking out loud what they really thought about politics. They were a gray mass. And this is what's happening if a society is surveilled. And if you are on one of the, yeah, on the bottom line of it or at the, on the top of the, the gray mass, you will try to go inside of the mass and not, well, um, yeah, that, that they don't see you. And this is, yeah, this is not only bad for democracy, but this is bad for a whole society. When artists who are doing subversal art going to jail because they do the subversal art, because they talk before with the person who is, for example, a well-known leftist, this can't be a good idea. And this is a chilling effect of it, that, yeah, people do not say anymore what they really think. Um. So I think electronic surveillance is worse than uh, human uh, surveillance uh, because you could see who's following you. You can turn around and look at the person. Um, with, with electronic surveillance, you are, you are uh, carrying a spying device in, on your pocket. So anywhere you go, the, um, the um, electronic company will know where, where you are, even without having having the the device uh, i mean the having somebody following you and it's going on all the time so it's just a matter of them uh choosing what to access when and it's all there for th for the taking so it's way worse than than eastern germany 
the difference here right now is that, of course, you don't have an oppressive regime that is going to use that against you, but that's the only thing missing. It's uh, the, the surveillance part is way worse. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, just following, following on from both of those thoughts about uh, the relationship between spying. Oh yeah, look, my spies just turned itself on. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. What I think is super weird now about this, uh, there's a nice visualization about how big the, the uh, uh, Stasi filing cabinet would have to be in order to carry all the stuff that's now recorded every day by metadata. And it's just a funny visualization because it's about the size of Europe. Although we actually know how big the filing cabinet is because you can see the building they're building in Utah to store all the stuff, right? So you can see how big the filing cabinet's going to be. But what I think is really weird now, as a detail of this, is not about figuring out what the government doesn't want you to say or what the government doesn't want you to think. It's also about figuring out what the computer program is going to think that you think. It's about the algorithms. That's super weird, right? I teach computing sometimes, okay? And there's a big push in the UK at the moment. Let's teach all the kids to do computing, because then we might have some kind of business future, because everything else seems pretty balked, right? We're going to have to learn about computing just in order to figure out what the algorithm thinks we're thinking, right? This is a very creepy future. Maybe like it, let's try in, in this moment to, to hear is there any question on this topic? No? Chilling effect is already there. <laughs> okay, fate. I know again the all the people who will ask something. <laughs> Okay, she wants to hear the utopian vision of. of okay. Um, good question. So, uh, hey, let's. Yeah. I'll let you think. <laughs> um, so. Um, I think it's the decentralized version, so where you don't control. So surveillance is already possible. It has been for thousands of years, but it's just very hard to manage it. It takes a lot of human effort to, to make it possible. So if you make it hard again, it's going to be way too difficult. And so yes, then again, you will be able to surveil. We're not saying that there shouldn't be surveillance at all. I think we made that clear in the fight against terrorism or whatever, uh, fighting serious crime and all of that, you're going to be able to do that still. But it's just going to, the, the effort that the government is going to take is way higher, way harder. So that's, we want to make that possible again. And the way we, you do that is by decentralizing the infrastructure. We have to get rid of the, you know, the mass email server, which is, I guess, Gmail and Yahoo and, and um, Outlook. Uh, if we do that, then I think we, we've made it. Uh, so we have solutions already for some of that. Um, the the uh, electronic services are are there. Maybe we're not, you know, y yet there with with the mobile phones, but we'll find a solution there again. Uh, um, well, I. I don't see the point in the decentralized infrastructure. I see the point that I want a world where the government is not mistrusting its own people. I want a world where a government elected by the people is working for the people and not against the people. Um, I, I know in theory they should do that. <laughs> but as, as it is with theories, it doesn't work out. And um, I want a world where I can go over the street, no matter how I look, what I believe, which sex or gender I have or whatever, and no one disrespect that. Because when we start with this, then the rest is coming as well. I would like to see people who are more educated about their personal data and how those data can be misused. 
if if we have people who know better, who knows better what will happen with their data, maybe we would be able to protect ourselves better. Uh, I'm a total optimist most of the time, and one of the things I'm optimistic about is the return of the idea of the commons. And I think one of the ideas for governing infrastructure is the idea of the commons. There was a great woman who's recently died, very sadly, called Eleanor Ostrom. She won the Nobel Prize for Economics, and she won that prize for really reintroducing and re-justifying the idea of the commons. She showed that this idea, you can check it out, the tragedy of the commons. You can't have things shared in common, and it will work. You have to have it privately owned, and then rules of the market, blah, blah, blah. Right? She showed that's not true. Okay? You can have things work governed in commons. And I think that's part of the, just part of the picture, the same as the stuff that these guys have talked about. Right, to a, a more positive future, and the, the commons is returning all over the place. Software was a place where it returned early on, right? The idea of, uh, of the free software, right, and the commons. In technology, the idea of the commons came back. It was lost from history, but now it's talked about a lot, and it's talked about in terms of energy, right, and infrastructure. The idea of the commons is making a comeback. So I think, uh, yeah, utopia is on its way, right? So, okay, my. My little piece of utopia will be that such a like crucial infrastructure or like crucial softwares or things like this will be like open, so we'll be able somehow to to see and audit some parts of of this process that is happening to us that is not hidden, that is not like a secret or things like this. But probably it's still utopia. But okay, uh, let's let's try to. The Kushrim is was making some kind of like uh, moves, special moves that we are like yeah, exchanging, and that means probably something. Okay, we should finish. Uh, let's try to to do s to see what we can do in this moment. Okay, what I'm interested now is okay. If you want to speak about tools, how we can protect ourselves and things like this, you you should chase some of those people after the talk, not him. Some okay. But what are the next steps? Okay, the law is going to be introduced, probably. Is there going to be some actions? How people can participate? Is it possible to do something? Yeah, the, the law is coming back. And with the recent uh, uh, terrorism scare, uh, it's going to be that is going to be used as a justification. The thing here is that Massive surveillance doesn't work in on fighting terrorism. The NSA uh, has a $10 billion budget a year, and it hasn't discovered a single case of terrorism from zero. A single case. It Yeah, surveillance can help if you know where to look for information, but if you go just by recording everyone and trying to determine who the terrorist is in the crowd, it hasn't worked in the US, and they are really good at it, believe me. So what do we do? Uh, EU clearly is not on our side, EU and the US, because they are, um, they are targets of terrorism themselves. They have introduced similar laws themselves, and uh, they don't have any interest. They don't care about my privacy here in Kosovo. Uh, they want their security in London and in Washington, so they are not our friends. Um, then we have the problem of rule of law in Kosovo, which is way different, way lower. That's what our European friends tell us. But at the same time, they're going to they want to push similar level of, or European level of surveillance. I'm using this a lot, you've noticed. Um, so again, we have a problem here, and they're not our friends. On top of this law, we're also getting uh, a, a SIM registration. Actually, th that is alre already in force. There was not a single, uh, or at least very little pushback against that. And they are going to, uh, they want to record IMA records as well. So that's also coming for us. And of course, this is a privacy practice from Turkey. And they say they are very uh, proud of it. Of course, uh, you don't want to rely on Turkey for uh, privacy and so these are these are some issues that are coming back we have to fight it's not a done deal uh, I believe that we can push again against this because this is illegal and according to the Court of Justice of the European Union this is illegal so 
the European Commission sh shouldn't be pushing that and can't push it back. Okay, just shortly, con uh, the draft law most probably will go to Parliament. What we've done in the past as Bern, we've worked a lot with uh, opposition parties, and this is what we're going to do. Uh, first, we have to see who will be in opposition, but once we know it, then we'll have to, uh, if we see that they want to move on with, with this law, we'll have to work with opposition and other civil society organizations to object this law. I hope we will have European Commission backing us, because they knew now they know that the, the law uh, should not be, be passed this way, but we will follow the law, we will monitor it, and we will advocate against it. Okay, but I still didn't hear what those people are going to do tomorrow. Like, so uh, how, how y is there going to be some something that you it will uh, involve? Yeah, I heard like what's bad. I heard like uh, what your organization is going to do, but it's like you know, like it's these legal things. Is that that's a bit like boring for people? Is there going to be some protest or is going to be some? people on the streets or like uh, some even some click activism like click here if like you don't like to be surveillance or something like this well of course if we have more support from people be that with a protest be that with online campaigning or petition whatever it will help our cause because it's not the same if you are alone there and the last public debate we were it was it was only myself and some people from from stick because nobody else cared. And if we have only few people just you know, going around the ministry and objecting the law, it will not have the same impact as it would have with more people. So if people want to join, one way w there are a lot of ways, and we invite them to come to our place and see for future pos possibilities. Oh. <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, start using encryption, right? Start using tools like Tor. Download Tor, right? Number one, download Tor, that's it, easy. Start browsing without being tracked. Organize some crypto parties. You don't need super experts, right? You can teach each other. There's loads of materials out there now how to get a bit more crypto. So you, of course, contest this stuff on a legal basis, but don't rely on it. It's like they're gonna stick to the law anyway, okay? So start protecting yourself. <laughs>
So they were even talking to people that they talked to him. So in this in this camp, there were not only Mongolians, but many, many other people from other countries as well. And they were sitting together, and the monk was listening. And the Mongolians paid people to tell him wrong things. So they sent him home with a letter <laughs> to the Pope, where they said that um, they should obey, <laughs> and Europe should subordinate to the Mongols. And whole Europe was afraid again, and they thought that the Mongolians would come, and they planned to come again. But unfortunately, this Khan and his brother were like, "Okay, let's have a little bo little civil war," <laughs> and uh, they fought each other. And no Mongol had ever been seen in Europe again with a weapon. So this is the first time we had counterintelligence, <laughs> where we have a book about it. The first organi really organized intelligence service was by order of Elizabeth I of England. She became queen in 1558, and um, it was a time when the Catholics and the Protestants in England were fighting each other. She was Catholic, and she hated, uh, no, she was Protestant, sorry, and she hated the Catholics. She hated them. And there was this Mary Stuart, her, well, yeah, in a way, sister, and she hated her. <laughs> and she had this guy, you see him there, it's uh, Francis Walsingham, who it was the closest man to the Queen, and he organized spies all over the UK and the European continent. And because of this man, bam! Maria Stewart got killed. Off with the hat. It was because they made intelligence service inside of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Then we had the Cabinet Noir. Um, you know, you might know these old letters with the seal. In 1628, Cardinal Richelieu ordered to make this. Um, this cabinet was in Paris, and it was built to read all letters getting out of Paris or getting inside of Paris, especially by the people who were on the court of the king. And as these letters were sealed, it was hard to read them, but they just were like, okay, let's open it and redo the seal. So they, they faked the seals. In 1760, the number secretary, or later secret number chamber, <laughs> in Vienna, had the biggest collection of faked seals ever in whole of Europe. <laughs> because it is the same. In 1743, the secret du roi was only to read, uh, not, not, not to read the letters, but it was the first intelligence service to make diplomacy a side of the official ways. So it was the first time that a secret service was talking with another secret service. What we still do today. So if Chancellor Merkel wants to talk in a non-official way to another representative of the state, she uses the intelligence service for that. And they do all states. So it's like shadow diplomacy. In fact, 1775, General Washington used spies against the Brits. And he learned from the Brits how to do it. <laughs> but hey, today we have email. Everything is better. I think not. In fact, the Cabinet Noir, uh, the same is doing the, the NSA is doing the same shit, and I mean the same. And the BND, my from my country, the Bundesnachrichtendienst. Well, they do as well, and the Brits and the French and the Chinese and the Russian, everyone does it like they did 300 years ago, because every emperor in Europe had such a cabinet noir. All had them. Um, and in this time, we had the first time as well that um, we had uh, commercial spionage. So there was this white gold. 
parts of land. And no one could do it. But there was this little German king who paid scientists to find out how it works. And they found out in Meissen. And they were able to produce it, and all other emperors and kings and whatever in, in Europe wa were like, I want that! Give it! But they started to, well, split the production process that no one knows completely what is happening. And this little city, in, in this time it had about a thousand people living there, was full of spies. <laughs> they tried to get the recite. And they wanted to know how, how the oven is built and everything. And in one time, they, they got one who knew the whole production process to Vienna. And then they bought him back. So they even paid him more money <laughs> to come back. So in this time, intelligence service was much relayed on money. And today, oh, as well, because you need money to buy hardware. <laughs> yeah, but um, these is a short history on this time. Let's go to um, World War I. Spying the Tsar. In 1913, the Habsburg intelligence found the spy who was giving all plans to the Russian Tsar. So the, the Habsburgs had had ideas of troop movement and how to 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 bring the goods and everything within the war, and they made detailed plans and wrote them down, of course, that they just can execute them, and someone gave it to the Russians. And it was one of their own spies. <laughs> there was a man called Alfred Redel. He was working for the intelligence of the Harbox. He was general of the army. Railroad plans, tra troop movements, everything. And um, they were, yeah, he sold it to the, to the Russians. So Habsburg, or the Germans, changed their plans. And the Germans lost the war, as we know today. Romanov could sit in peace and with his family, you know the rest of the story, uh, and the Germans lost the war. And Wilhelm needed to go into exile and made place for the first German democracy, which lasted, well, till 1933, till the Nazis came. <laughs> Next intelligence services in Europe. The Third Reich had many, many different intelligence services. They had the Amt für Auslandabwehr, so it's a department of uh, foreign countries and um, missing a word uh, and defense. They had uh, the Geheime Feldpolizei. Oh, I love these German words; <laughs> they just sound great. They had the Abteilung Fremde Heere. So the second one is uh, the secret police in the field. So it was the military police. Uh, the third one is the um, department for spying on the foreign armies. And they had, of course, the Reichssicherheitshauptamt with the Gestapo. We all heard about that. And they had the Sicherheitsdienst. So they had a big network of civil and, militar and military um, intelligence services. And some of them looked like this. Some looked like normal people. In fact, um, they were all organized in a military way, which is important. So even if it was a civilian intelligence service, they worked like the military. And then there was the th Enigma thingy thing. <laughs> we all think the Germans built it, but it was, it's not true. It's from a Polish man. <laughs> he built it in 1926. Arthur Scherbius is his name. He built this machine, Enigma, and with this the Germans could uh, encrypt their their uh, their radio signal, and especially the German undersea boat fleet used it. But there was, fortunately, Alan Turing and his team in Bethlehem Park, 
who broke this algorithm. WA, thanks Alan Turing, because now the um, the Allied troops knew where the Germans wanted to go. The Allied troops now knew where the safe harbors of the Germans were. They even knew where the different stations for the Air Force, for the, German Air, for the Luftwaffe were. And so this team of Alan Turing and the researchers in Bechtel Park, they ended the war and historians are sure about this, help that it ended years earlier than it might have ended if this code had not been broken. On the other hand, there was a German guy in Tokyo, uh, in the embassy. He was a trade man called Richard Sorge. Um, he was spying on the Japanese at a time when in Japan everyone was suspected to spy. No one suspected that he would do it. <laughs> and um, he gave the, uh, he warned Russia that the Japanese want to attack Russia, which is in fact true. But the Russians didn't believe him. <laughs> and it needed till the 80s till the Russians built a monument statue for him and his effort to warn them. So, yeah. Then, after the war, German Democratic Republic had the Ministerium for Staatssicherheit, so Ministry for State Security. This is a picture of the 35-year uh, jubilee of this ministry. And, yeah, the German Democratic Republic, they had um, this ministry, or this, well, intelligence service, where they had this idea to have unofficial members. So they had, on the one hand, then regular agents. On the other hand, they had um, people where they asked, hey, you know your neighbor, he's a little bit suspect. Wouldn't you like to tell us a bit about him? Like everything, what he had done, is doing, and will do? That would be great, and hey, you get you get your car five years earlier. And this is how they worked. And there were several million people spying. Hey, we will write a test about this. <laughs> there were several million people spying on each other in the German Democratic Republic. And um, yeah, so it's, it's utterly insane. But more insane is the, this guy. So this is... <laughs> This is Reinhard Gehlen. He was working for the Nazis. He was a general in the Wehrmacht. He was uh, in the Heereskuppe Ost, which were spying on the other armies. And after Germany lost the war, he was spying for the US Army on the Russians. <laughs> and after we founded the new German Republic, he, he went to, to, Kanzler, to Chancellor Adenauer and said, hey, um, you know, by the way, I'm a spy, and I know how to do it. <laughs> and there was the organization Gehlen. And they were doing intelligence service to every country in Europe. And then they founded the Bundesnachrichtendienst out of this organization. In fact, he was not, not that. Well, he, he was very clever, because when he saw that the Germans lost the war, um, wow, whoa, I had some... Um, Oops. <laughs> yeah. Um, they had uh, caskets in the woods with all the documentation about the Russians. And he just gave them to the, to the US Army. And this is why they did not put him into a, uh, a prisoner of war camp. And as the US Army was working with, it, with him, Adenauer thought, OK, it's cool to work with this guy. In fact, this man killed millions of people and was the leader of the German intelligence service. But not only um, surveillance on armies and states, on social movement. 1909 was the FBI founded, and 1930 Roosevelt asked them to research subversives. And this was the time when they spotted on Martin Luther King Jr., when they started to surveil him. And when they tried 
to place bad news about him in the newspapers. Luckily, they failed. Uh, even his home got wiretapped, by the way, and the home of his friends. So they really did a good job. Uh, in 1909, the MI5 was formed, a military intelligence service. It's for the UK, for the, in the interior service. And they were searching for communists. You know, communists, all over Europe, communists. And so in 1991, after the wall came down, after the Cold War ended, they infiltrated green uh, and environmental groups to find out if they are communists. And they went this far that the agents made babies with the women in these groups, which is really disgusting, because they made it that they have a more emotional and closer relationship, that they get more information about the communists who should be there. But not only, uh, well, in fact, they found nothing, of course. Uh, but not only uh, the British or the USA are spying on the social movements. In Germany, we had a big issue at the airport in Frankfurt. We needed a, a new uh, um, airway. And we had demonstrators against that. And the federal police in Germany began to spy at the people who were dem demonstrating against it on the streets. And after this had been known by the public, then the violence started, not before that. And then the, the federal police said, yeah, we were right, they are all violent. And um, just revealed a few years ago, the suffragettes in the UK, the women who were fighting for the right to vote for women, were surveilled. Scotland Yard ma had revealed photos of them. 90 years later, they, f they opened up an archive with over 2,000 pictures of suffragettes in their home places, walking, something. And yeah, they really were spying with them on camera. So it's the first CCTV thingy thing with photos, but yeah, it was in the UK. Where else? But now to my special friends. <laughs> we like them. On the 16th of July, 1947, Truman said, let's build this thing, the CIA. And they built it, and they started to work. And the first thing they did was to manipulate the election in Italy in 1948. In 1953, they assassinated the Iranian premier minister. In 1954, they helped to downfall the Guatemalan president. In 1961, they uh, gave weapons to the people in Cuba, uh, who should in invade Cuba. Uh, by the way, th they tried to kill uh, Fidel Castro at least eight times, which, which are known, and they failed. This guy just turned 90. Um, and in 1961, they were delivering um, weapons to kill Tujillo in the Dominican Republic. In 1963, they helped for political change in Vietnam, not with the soldiers, but they uh, helped to kill Ngo Dinh Diem, the prime minister. He was found dead with a bullet in his head, and they were, were like, that was suicide, but his hands were on his back, knotted but was a clear case of suicide. Uh, in 1968, the CIA ran torture centers in Vietnam against the Viet Cong. So this is the first case where we know that the CIA tortured. In 1973, in Chile, um, after the junta took over the power, they delivered lists for the death squads who should be killed. In 1981, Nicaragua, they helped to change the system. And since 2001, the CIA tried to find bin Laden in, um, in Afghanistan. These are just the things we know, which are for sure, where we have seen documents or where the president said that it's true. Um, the CIA was founded to um, protect the United States of America. 
In fact, it's not protecting the country. In fact, it's protecting the hegemonial power of the United States. This is the job of the CIA, that the, Ameri that the USA do not lose power in the Western Hemisphere. And all the, the, uh, the dates I read, in all these cases, there were people in power or became, in, uh, well, or had been removed, where the US were in fear that people could turn against the United States from outside. And um, yeah, so this is what, what uh, the CIA did. <laughs> in fact, um, come on. We have another one. Uh, it's a seal of the NSA in the middle. It was found on November the 4th, 1952. It's part of the Pentagon, and since 1971, they built this, called Radons, Project Echelon. They were surveilling all phone calls and all faxes all over the world. These are not the radons which they used to spy on, 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 on Russia or the, the East Bloc. These were the ones they used to spy on the, on, on the French from Germany. So um, we have, uh, for example, in Germany we have dozens of them sitting on mountains. And it's very analog technique to get all phone calls, which were analog in these times, and, and faxes. They really read the faxes. Today, it's closed down. This is uh, the old one uh, in Berlin, Teufelsberg. It's now, now it's a nice party location, by the way. <laughs> we have fun with this. But what did we learn today? Dear Princess Celestia, today I learned. Um, it's all about power to keep up the status quo. And it doesn't matter which intelligence service it is doing. So the Germans, the French, the British, the, uh, the Russians, the Chinese, it's always about hegemonial power they want to keep. And, which is very important, most intelligence services origin from military. The NSA belongs to the Pentagon. It's not a civil intelligence service. It's a military service. And every time when the military tries to get control of something, like information, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Um, we always get these war on terror, cyber war, war on drugs, thingy thing. We always get this war term to justify that military services are working in these fields, or military-like services. I mean, we had, we had cases when, when uh, US soldiers went to South America to burn down cocaine. It were soldiers. And it was a military invention, uh, intervention, and it's always military when we speak about intelligence services. The German intelligence service origined from the Wehrmacht. The French origined as well from, um, from military. The Russian origined from military. So when, when Lenin built up uh, the first um, intelligence service in, in Russia, he, cho he chose some of his best comrades to do it. There's always a chain of command. And the one problem with the military services is that they operate in secrecy. So if we say we need more transparency on them, it just doesn't work. If you put transparency on a secret service, it's not secret anymore and will fail. So this is nothing we, we should want. We should want that we ban all intelligence services like we ban landmines. This is the only solution we have to get rid of the total surveillance of the world. Thanks for listening, Groucho Marx. Questions? Oh, there's a question.
Okay, um, I'll ask it. I'll ask the big one. How? How what? How to ban all intelligence reviews. Burn them down. <laughs> I mean it. I'm, I mean it. <laughs> um, for example, in Berlin, we have this new building of the Bundesnachrichtendienst, which is still empty. And they build it and build it. And it's, it's, it's there, and it's not burning now. I don't get it. <laughs> no, in fact, of course, um, we need to educate people. We need to educate people who are going to vote. And we need to tell them why intelligence services are dangerous to us. As dangerous as landmines, in fact. So it's about education. It's always about education. Or burning things down, of course. But let's take the education part. It's, I think, not that bad. Oh, another question. I love I love it when my friends ask questions. So, but okay, we are voting like every four four years or something like this. But most of the time, it's not on the program of the political parties. Um, well, this is a problem with uh, secret services. They operate in secrecy, and I'm not sure if it was a program of a political party. The thing is that in most cases, the government doesn't know what their secret service is doing. There might be one or two persons who know what, what they are doing, but not the whole government, and even not the political parties. And for example, uh, we have uh, a working group in the German parliament for the control of the Bundesnachrichtendienst. They get the news from the Bundesnachrichtendienst out of the newspaper in most cases. Um, in the moment where you tell a parliament as a secret service what you're doing, it's not secret anymore. So a secret service will do everything to keep its secrecy. And in most cases, those services get their own lives and their own agenda. We saw this uh, with the FBI in, in the States, when they were on the, on the hunt for communists, where, they, where everyone was a communist, under Hoover. Um, the idea of the president was, yeah, look if there are some communists, and he was starting to hunt. It was his own agenda for the FBI to hunt every communist down. And um, for example, in Germany, our uh, interior service, when we had in the 70s the Red Army fraction, the they sold them the weapons. They sold the terrorists the weapons inside of our own country. Uh, in the last 10 years we had uh, neo-Nazis rolling through Germany, killing people. They got the weapons by the interior secret service of Germany. And afterwards, so 10 years later they said, oh, we knew nothing. So you cannot trust a secret service, never, ever, and they will do whatever they think is best for their for them that they can perform their job to, well, protect someone, whoever this might be. Another question. Uh, does the government have the does the government have the power to shut down the secret service? Because I've seen that it's like they are beyond. Um, I think the only power we have in a country who can shut down a secret service is on the one hand the government by doing it and really destroying the buildings. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> so yeah, to shut down a secret service is very hard. But, but I think it works. It's only on the hands of the government? Or um, well, we, we could do the same as we did in Eastern Germany and just storm the building and try to burn everything, but I think this is the way we don't want to act. Yeah, but, but Maybe I want to act like this, but maybe you don't want to act like this. In the last, I don't know how many years, like tens of years, the, the, the power is not anymore in the buildings. You know, it's a concept of like 19th century or something. So by destroying the building, you are not doing a lot because the power is not inside of the buildings. Well, um, the well, uh, it depends. Uh, a secret service will never store their stuff in the cloud. <laughs> 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 they will keep it on several 
on several places in their own country. And um, so, some someone and and we should we need to start somewhere. So, if we close down, so get all their money. So don't give them any more money. And uh, which is hard, by the way, as they have so many different accounts under different names. And yeah, acting against a secret service is even hard for this for the state and for the government. But someone needs to start. And well, if we don't have I think we should solve it in a political way, without burning down things. Even if I like burning down things, but we should try it in a political way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> like for example, in, in in Belgrade in 2000, there was like some kind of revolution or something. So uh, the Milosevic didn't fell down because someone burned the parliament. He fell down because Jinjic, the leader of the opposition made the deal uh, with the special forces, with the agencies, in order to to change the power. But then, after like three years or four years, they killed him again. The same people, the same source of power. The buildings, I, I don't think the, the buildings are like really like... Uh, maybe, okay, we maybe, find, maybe we need to find special solutions for every country. Special solution for a special service. <laughs> no, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that because uh, I'm seeing also in Cuba that how the secret police act completely independently and wild, and there is no any way how to control or accountability or anything. Well, um, they have a chain of command, and someone yeah. is in charge. And if this guy is gone, and they still do this, then take the next guy, and so on. And someone, on, on one point, the chain of command and the chain of resources is broken. But you, you should also take, uh, uh, like, the politician is also a human being that have a history. And this history is, like, uh, uh, stored by the Secret Service. Yeah, of course. So they <laughs> this is this loop of things. Yeah, you are not and, able to and, and I think that we have, um, we need the culture of forgiving politicians if they did wrong 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Because we will never, ever, 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 ever say, okay, you said sorry and you made a mistake and it was bad, but now you're acting like a human guy. It's, uh, it's okay now and we will talk about this later. In fact, when someone, something is revealed, any file about any politician, normally it's getting a scandal out of it and people are, well, thrown out of town. And this is, of course, a culture. It, it makes fun throwing out people. But it's a bad culture of, no, don't burn them down. <laughs> yeah, so I think we need to change our, our culture. So thank you all. It was fun talking to you. Have a nice evening. Bravo.